Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Naomi McLeod, and I am the program manager at APDA's American Parkinson Disease Association with the Virginia chapter. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am pleased to welcome you to our monthly webinar series, a program designed for people with Parkinson's disease, as well as their care partners, family members, and healthcare providers. We're very grateful to have Dr. Sadie Sheaf for volunteering her time to present today's topic on igniting Parkinson's disease while, while living with PD. After some brief announcements, Dr. Sadie Sheaf will make her presentation, after which there will be a Q&A session where you'll be able to ask your question about today's topic. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Previous slide. The American Parkinson's Disease Association, Virginia chapter, APDA for short, is a part of the largest grassroots network dedicated to fighting Parkinson's disease and to helping more than 1.2 million people live with Parkinson's disease, live life to the fullest. The APDA Virginia chapter offers a variety of services to our constituents around the Commonwealth. Please visit our website to visit all that we have to offer. Our website also hosts a wealth of information on publications, webinars, programs, and research updates that can help you understand Parkinson's disease. If you are visiting from another state, Note that we have other chapters and locations all around the United States, and you can find their contact information on our website as well. The bottom line is APDA is here for you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sadie Sheaf to our board, to introduce Dr. Sadie Sheaf. Dr. Sadie Sheaf is a board certified clinical sexologist and licensed clinical social worker. She has started working in the field of mental health and practicing psychotherapy and a clinical sexologist in several clinical settings throughout the United States and Europe. Her passion as a therapist, educator, researcher, lecturer, and speaker spanned 37 years. Dr. Sheaf has personally worked with thousands of men and women of all nationalities, creeds, ethnicities, and social economic backgrounds. Presently, she is a clinical director and CEO of DQS Communications Healthcare Group. She is also the social work manager in mental health and director of social work student interns education for the Veterans Affairs Medical Center. Dr. Sheaf has also been an adjunct professor in the, in the Masters of Social Work program at Norfolk State University. She was nominated to chair Men Mental Health Advisory Board, City of Portsmouth, Virginia. Dr. Sheaf has also served two terms on the Virginia State Board for the National Association of Social Work. Please welcome Dr. Sadie Sheaf. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today, we're talking about a very, very uh, important subject. We're talking about sex. Uh, we're talking about your sexual health. Uh, as a therapist, as a clinician, as a sexologist, you know, all parts of our lives are important. And when you touch one part, they all move. There's your sexual health, your mental health, your physical health, your emotional health. All of these things are very important. So the most important thing I want to do to you today as a clinical sexologist is I wanna talk about Parkinson's and sex. With Parkinson's disease, uh, it is known that there will be a decrease in your sexual functioning and that is inevitable. It is inevitable uh, because of the disease itself. And some of those 
areas that are there that one may be suffering from a sexual dysfunction or a decrease in sexual desire or lack for sexual desire, low libido, difficulties with orgasms and orgasmic functions. This is part of what comes along with this chronic progressive neurological disease. It is going to impair one sexuality in one way or another because it's progressive in nature. But the, the news today, the good news is that no matter how you are afflicted, the sexual health and the sexual functioning uh, that uh, may be diminished can be faced. And the sex lives of those suffering from Parkinson's can be restored. Uh, there's a challenge to this. And the challenge to this is the disease itself. So the most important thing that can happen is that we talk about these challenges and equip the person suffering from Parkinson's or significant other with ways of understanding how to make for less disruptions in the lovemaking and to know how to deal with these problems with their sexual functioning as they arise and as they happen because problems are going to arise. That's the good news. They can be dealt with effectively. Next slide, please. Psychological trauma. With psychological trauma, we are talking about the issue that comes along with Parkinson disease itself, or Parkinsonism. And that's gonna be depression. Depression um, is going to affect about 40% of individuals who suffer from Parkinson's. The, the depression itself can cause uh, sexual impairment and sexual dysfunctioning in an individual. And because there's a depression that goes along with the disease itself, there is the idea that it would in fact impact your sexual functioning. But at the same time, you can also become depressed because of having the issue of the knowing that dopamine and other uh, and the neurons in the brain that are affected by Parkinson's are going to cause sexual dysfunction themselves. So the thing that I will also share with you is that the medication that has to be taken for depression can also cause sexual dysfunction. Those are the antidepressants. There can be those side effects. So when you look at the depression that may come from Parkinson's, when you look at the antidepressants and the medication that one may take, uh, because the mood of an individual with Parkinson's is greatly affected. Those are the parts that become the inevitable because of the chronicity of the progression of the disease. Other things can cause sexual difficulties as we're discussing this, because it's so important to understand that in order to know how to move toward this piece of restoring uh, the sexual dysfunctions that may happen and to work toward keeping health with one's sexual functioning, it's important to understand as much as we can about the problem that sets. Some sexual difficulties are about the emotional issues uh, that people suffer from who also have Parkinson's. And those issues may include anger and stress, grief and mental fatigue, which goes along with the illness. These things also can affect one's self-esteem. One's self-esteem can be affected by the idea that with the progression of the disease, there are changes that the person experiences with the physical uh, appearance, uh, tremors, shaking, 
uh, uh, change uh, perhaps from the person in their uh, body image uh, about the way they see themselves and about the way they feel that their partner may see them, changes in skin texture, or even in body smells because of the medication that is associated uh, with, uh, with the Parkinson's medication that one may be taking. These things can inhibit one's sexual expression and even one's sexuality. So these kinds of psychological issues greatly impact a person. Even as they're learning about the illness, as things are happening to them, and it can even impact their partner. Uh, and it impacts their partner too in ways that may be about having perhaps some feeling of resentment about the changes that may be happening with their partner with Parkinson's, or uh, even dealing with their own feelings uh, about the diagnosis itself, uh, their own fear, their own anxiety. And sometimes with what's happening to the, the individual with Parkinson's and the partner, there may be an issue of loss of attraction or even sexual interest due to the symptoms related to Parkinson's because of the various changes that take place in the body. Um, and these things greatly impact how one experiences sexuality and experiences themselves. What I'd like to do is in talking about the psychological uh, piece of this, uh, for some that can be traumatic because even just finding that they have the disease and understanding where the disease is going to affect them can be quite troubling. Um, and for the family, it can be the same. That's why it's so important uh, to be involved and stay involved with these things that educate and inform about the illness and it can empower you as you're moving along and addressing the issues that come naturally with the illness, the depression for the person suffering from the Parkinson's, as well as the double piece of how that depression can affect one's sexuality. And then also understanding about your partner or significant other and how they too can be impacted. What I'm going to do today is as we go along, I'll be talking a bit about some of the psychological piece of the Parkinson's illness that you may, that may show up in one sexual expression and in one sexuality. And I'm also going to be addressing relationship issues throughout. I will also be addressing sexual intimacy issues. And I will be going into these into more details. Uh, so can we please have the next slide? When it comes to dealing with Parkinson's, let's talk about the importance of communication, which uh, too was a part of the first slide. When you're looking at relationships that are impacted by Parkinson's, you look at friendships. Now we're talking about the whole person. We're talking about how all relationships are important. Even before I go more into detail about talking about the sexuality uh, with the person with Parkinson's and their partner. It's important to maintain friendships where one can. And it's important to be open to creating new ones. This really helps self-esteem, it helps when one is dealing with feelings of fear, anxiety, anger. It kind of develops a sense of community around you. And a lot of times when a person is dealing with these kinds of issues of, uh, that can cause one to isolate and cause one to um, not feel good about themselves, having that sense of community Having those friendships are important. And believe it or not, those things we feel good about also impact us 
in, in every way as a whole person. And now it particularly can impact us in our sexual health and our, in our sexual practices. The other piece that uh, is important is with your partner. Communication is critical in both places. Even when you're talking with friends, it's good to keep open good communication about talking about how you feel, having someone to talk to and not isolate. When it comes to your partner, it's important to talk about the changes in the relationship. It's important to talk about the changes that may be taking place and we know that will inevitably take place, which is going to be the change or a diminish in one's sexual functioning. And it's important to have open communication about what you may be experiencing and allow your partner, when it comes to partner spouse relationships, to be able to express what they may be experiencing. Uh, you can also talk about ways that roles may change in the relationship, um, responsibilities to each other, and also the way sometimes roles can change at work. Or even if you are at work, uh, if you're dealing with your partner or spouse, you may consider changing hours, doing different things. Or your partner may talk about how, you know, there are things that they may be able to do uh, in the process of the communication that may impact your sexual functioning in a way that may be positive, which will make more sense as we move along. And I lay more expression and meaning to talking about the issues that are related to the diminishing um, sexual functioning. The next relationship I wanna talk about is family. Um, it's important for you as a person suffering from Parkinson's to encourage your family, your parents, your siblings, your friend, not only your friends, extended family members to do things like take a look at this website um, and to understand and become educated and knowledgeable about the Parkinson's illness and how one is affected. It will go a long way, again, to keeping some sense of community, keeping communication in a positive. And now what I will roll out more is a piece of partner and spouse, relationship and communication. Next slide, please. Every couple is different. No two couples are the same. What is satisfying for one may not be for the other. And as a couple, it is so important to talk with your mate or your partner about issues that you may be experiencing, issues that you may be having with your sexual functioning or change that you may be experiencing. And they too should explain or express to you, or you can encourage them to express to you any changes in their functioning, meaning their desire, their attraction, anything that they may be experiencing. They too may also be experiencing a bit of depression and depression itself can affect sexual functioning, as I stated earlier. When it comes to um, the sexual functioning, I'm gonna talk a bit about the sexual dysfunction. Parkinson's itself affects, of course, the autotomic nervous system, which controls sexual response and functioning. Uh, what happens is Parkinson's act upon that part of the brain uh, or acts upon the neurons in the brain that deals with the sexual functioning, uh, which causes dopamine nerves in the neurons to die. Since dopamine is a chemical that transmits signals uh, between parts of the brain, that this coordinates smooth muscle movement. It's critical to sexual functioning in two ways. So the most important thing is to know that Parkinson's affects dopamine. And it affects the dopamine in the sense that it causes these cells to die. The first function that I'll talk about 
that the uh, decrease of dopamine effects is going to be just the drop in the dopamine is automatically going to decrease your sex drive and your sexual interests. That's going to happen. The second level is that the lack of dopamine in the body and that the, the death of those cells uh, causes the loss of balance. It causes changes in walking and posture, uh, changes in muscle uh, rigidity, uh, tremors, it slows you down. Uh, you can't be as spontaneous in your activity and it causes symptoms uh, that are seen, as you know, in the Parkinson's disease itself. And tremors are also the result of the less or the decreasing of the dopamine in the brain, which uh, the disease again, as I stated, impacts. Symptoms can also be seen um, when movement is slowed down, muscle tremors, and this rigidity. Um, it intrudes on one's love life. It intrudes on your love making. Uh, this change uh, in the phys physical uh, as far as the tremors, the rigidity, the stiffness, the slow movement can be painful. And it can also make sex painful. And it can really be uncomfortable. A lot of times, fatigue um, and just the inability to control body movements with a person suffering from Parkinson's it can make sex less pleasurable. And they may find themselves kind of forced to not be as involved sexually as they would normally be and to be passive about their engagement because of the discomfort uh, with what's happening with their body as a part of Parkinson's. Uh, the slowed movement in the body and the physical pain can be substantial at times. Another impairment that is caused or another symptom of this decrease in sex drive and uh, sexual interest and functioning is erectile dysfunction. Parkinson's disease impacts the nervous system and because it impacts the nervous system, men with Parkinson's often find themselves unable to attain or maintain erections. It also affects the blood flow and the blood flow itself and the blood circulation also affects the male, which causes erectile dysfunction. That is, that is one of the symptoms of the male sexual dysfunction. With the female, it can be, as I stated uh, before, it can be orgasmic um, dysfunction, low libido, difficulties in orgasmic functioning is probably a better way to say it. And so, when a woman or a man suffers from Parkinson's, there are these symptoms that come with the Parkinson's disease itself that impacts them. Hypersexuality. Hypersexuality itself is a side effect, uh, uh, is, is one of the issues that also come with the decrease in one's sexual functioning. And with hypersexuality, uh, medication uh, that is anti-Parkinsonism uh, causes one to be hypersexual. And in being hypersexual, this is where the 
individual is a bit compulsive with their sexual behavior and in being compulsive with the sexual behavior, uh, it can cause one to act out sexually. Uh, and acting out meaning that you may have a partner that if you develop hyper hypersexuality, which impacts about 1% of people with Parkinson's, that you know your partner may be dealing with their own issues about being sexual or being involved. And if a person is hypersexual, that can sometimes become a problem with the couple because one may be one may want sex more than the other partner, and one may become very agitated or irritated, and it can also cause one to act out. Seeking guidance. In seeking guidance, it's important to go to right away the next thing that we're talking about, which is the next slide, resolving sexual relationship issues. In seeking guidance, relationship issues that are, or redefining sexual intimacy is very important. It's important for the couple to look at redefining their sexual relationship or their sexual intimacy. I'm going to talk in detail about that as I talk about that piece as solutions. And redefining sexual intimacy, I could, like I stated, every couple is different. And there are creative ways that couples can enhance their relationship that will keep and continue satisfaction, um, continue desire, um, and continue to make the relationship enjoyable. Uh, this new role um, uh, makes it uh, important for the couple to understand that both the physical and psychological challenges with Parkinson's itself is inescapable by the person with Parkinson's as well as their partner. And ultimately, it impacts the couple's relationship. Many times when it comes to uh, sexual dynamics and sexual relationships, it's been found that those uh, persons suffering from Parkinson's um, within their relationship are less satisfied uh, with their sexual functioning than has been their healthier counterparts. And you can see why. However, um, it's important to understand that also what can happen in the process of what a person is going through when it comes to all the changes that are happening to them physically um, because of what's going on in their body and also with the partner, things like the most important, uh, which we're gonna talk about that are important to keep up, things like affection can somehow become less important. Um, this can be um, just not being uh, affectionate toward each other as much. And when people have been together for long periods of time and they talk about relationships that have lasted over a long period of time, many times the affection in the relationship goes. The new role uh, is to replace these things and work at putting these pieces, the affection, the intimacy, the communication back into the relationship. And the way that happens is that it's important for the couple to be able to sit down and to talk and to talk particularly about sex and about what's happening to you in your relationship. One thing to talk about is medication. Medication can cause a decrease in libido and also it can impact uh, one's sexual desire. It's important for uh, the couple, the person suffering from Parkinson's to talk about the medication with their doctor 
especially if you believe that your medication is impacting um, your sexual libido or if it's impacting your desire. Um, the next thing that's important to talk about and to understand is that erectile dysfunction uh, itself, and even as I talk about the dopamine and I talk about how it impacts the body, how it impacts uh, the, the deadening of these cells. Um, there are different treatment that can be provided that will increase sexual functioning, uh, that will heighten the effects of dopamine. And it will encourage uh, that there be more uh, neurons produced through certain treatment and medications. Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, all of these things also impact ED, erectile dysfunction. They've been found to be helpful after they're used over a period of time, two months or more. There has been significant overall improvement in sexual functioning, desire, and an ability to experience and maintain an erection by males and to have an orgasm when they use these medications. And the piece of the good news is that this can be reversed uh, through treatment that can give longevity to one's sexual enjoyment and desire. The next thing to talk about is communication. Lover ne lovers need to talk about what's going on in their relationship. And it's important for you to discuss your fears and your concerns. And it's important for your partners to discuss their fears and their concerns. It's important to seek out a sex counselor like myself as in therapy or in sessions, I go much more into details. And there are many other things that can be done about issues with orgasmic disorders in women. Uh, there are different medications, different things that can be done to increase desire, uh, to increase libido. Uh, there are other methods that can be done to uh, improve erections um, and improve maintaining them. Um, and so in seeking professional help, uh, if it becomes necessary, it's important to do that because I sit with the couple and I talk about the fears and the other issues because sometimes it may be difficult to talk about that with, and that means sex to talk about that with your partner. And it may be difficult for your partner to talk about it. So that's really important to remember. The other piece to understand is it's important to go back to boosting each other's self-esteem. If you feel that affection is missing in your relationship, it's good to make a conscious effort to add that back to the relationship. It boosts your partner's self-esteem whether you're the significant other or the person suffering from Parkinson's. And to have that boost in self-esteem, you show affection and you verbalize it. You know, um, it's important to uh, let a person know if you find them attractive. And it's important, especially since many times people suffering from Parkinson's not only have the tremors and the other issues, the slowed movement, they're the facial expressions begin to change and diminish as well. And it's important to perhaps verbalize even if expressions may be lacking. When it comes to fatigue, fatigue takes place with people with Parkinson's often in the evening. Uh, so let's talk about a, a solution for that, how to move forward. And moving forward with that, Maybe it's a good time to try to engage sexually in the morning as opposed to later in the day and as opposed to the night. Try something new. Uh, it's important to talk to your partner about trying this new thing. Uh, you can also look at exercise. Um, exercise can also help to reduce fatigue sometimes and it does it a lot, but it's important to talk to your doctor 
when it comes to talking about exercise because it needs to be exercise that they agree that is okay for you. And this reduces fatigue, give you a bit more energy for perhaps morning sessions of sex or the different times a day. And that just adds a spark to the relationship to uh, engage at different times. When it comes to experimenting, it's important for couples to look at their sexual patterns and their attitudes and their habits. You know, maybe in talking, you can talk about things that your partner may want you to change, things you may want them to change. Uh, exploring new positions when it comes to sex and intimacy. These are things that are talked about and shared. Uh, and it's so important to do that, you know, uh, when you think about like the slowness of body movements and maybe other things that may be painful and uncomfortable to talk about exploring that. It leaves the person with Parkinson's and their partner an opportunity to redefine their sexual intimacy in ways that makes it much better for them. It empowers you in looking at your own sexual expression, your own sexual functioning, to, to have a voice um, and to reach out where necessary to get help, but to be aware that having Parkinson's, there is the inevitability of the diminishing of the sexual functioning, as well as to understand ways that this may happen from the from ED to body movement to desire to libido, all of those things. But when you find out and know that this is a part of what may go along with the illness, it also allows you more space to discuss and to talk about. As a sexologist, there is no stone unturned with a couple when it comes to their desire to have meaningful and enjoyable sex. And it's important to open that door on where people may be uncomfortable or inhibited to find ways to help them be comfortable. I hope uh, I've discussed this in a way that you may find it comfortable to talk about issues that are related to your sexual functioning. The beginning of the conversation about our whole health because everything is important. Next slide, please. At this point, this brings me to questions uh, that may have come up. All right. All right. Well, thank you well, thank so, you. so I'm at the mic, Dr. Sadie. Dr. Sadie. Okay, I'm doing it right now. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Shea, for an extremely insightful presentation today. So it is now time to go into our question and answer session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them at the Q&A section um, on your Zoom screen and then click Submit. Dr. Shafe will answer as many questions as possible in the time available. If we, if we do not get to your question, we'll do our best to get back to you and email you following the end of this program. So we've received a lot of questions uh, prior to this webinar series. So Dr. Shafe, let's dive right in. So the first question, we've received is how do you tell your potential new partner about your uh, sexual and physical limitations? So one of the things that's most important, just like in any relationship, when you're getting to know a person is to kind of, you know, you're sharing with them about your illness. And one of the things that you always want to do is invite them to, um, a bit of education about the illness itself and how you're impacted. Um, what one of the best things to do is to 
uh, open up the idea of concerns. Like uh, if there's concern about uh, sexual functioning, if there's concerns about intimacy, you know, you ease into that conversation by laying it out and allow them to ask you questions. And it's also okay to see uh, if it's, if you're very, very uncomfortable, it's okay also to seek some professional help. If you want to engage a conversation like with a person like myself as a sexologist, it's not unusual that uh, people will come to me uh, when they are beginning to experience issues that may impact their relationship. If you're meeting a new person, you know, you are going to talk about this. And when you talk about this, you're going to um, just keep it very clear, uh, very to the point. And if they're asking you questions you can't, uh, that you can't answer, you can say, well, why don't we talk to somebody about that? Or you'll be surprised uh, if they know something about Parkinson's, about a little bit of what they may already know. Okay, perfect. And so perfect. the best thing to do is always be honest, as honest as you can about talking about what you feel and what you're experiencing, especially when it's come, when it comes to your illness. Okay, so the next question. Yes, the next question we've received. Um, so are ED drugs, are they okay to use with levodopa, which is the common drug used for Parkinson's disease? One of the things that I would say to you is please make sure you speak to your doctor about that because individuals are different. Everybody is different. Uh, taking uh, Levitra, Cialis, uh, Viagra, and all of those are common uh, 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 medications that people take with ED who also have Parkinson's, but I still always encourage a person with Parkinson's and illnesses like this to check with your doctor first uh, before you do that. But uh, it's not uncommon to do that. So first you wanna get the thumbs up from your doctor and then proceed. Okay, perfect. Our next question are, what are some ways for men to maintain erection during intercourse? Uh, a lot of times what happened with the um, erection during intercourse or to maintain it, uh, there are several things that one can do, but it usually happens, I usually talk about this a lot more in detail inside of the office, but I'll talk just quickly, briefly here, given a statement. Um, it's um, uh, What one can do is they can delay entry, uh, when it comes to engaging in the sexual session itself. Uh, you can, uh, there are other techniques that uh, I would talk about more in detail sitting in a session with me that one may practice on themselves that can be very effective in uh, maintaining an erection. There are rings that people may get and there are other um, items that are available there are different creams that people may use uh, that um, will slow the, um, the, um, I, the loss of erection and will also help to maintain it. There are different medications and creams that we can use. Uh, there's a lot to be said about uh, delaying engagement. Uh, there's a lot to be said about, you know, um, how you make an effort um, to move sexually and delay in session. But these are things that I go into a lot more detail if a person is sitting in, sexual, in sessions with me because what may be affecting the erection itself uh, may, is gonna, it may be something different for each person. Uh, so there is uh, also the idea of dealing with ED, uh, a book called She Comes First, He Comes Second, where it's about uh, um, like premature ejaculation attained and that is also some pieces that can affect the idea of erections. There are different techniques that are there that you can read about that can help you with that. And even more in detail uh, in an office setting, I would uh, speak specifically to the person giving them that. Okay, thank you. So our next question 
is how can I maintain sexual intimacy while dealing with incontinence? I think you're muted. Dr. Sadie, you're muted. Um, okay, I'm unmuted now, right? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. Uh, can you repeat that question, Naomi, just one more time for me? How can I manage sexual intimacy while dealing with incontinence? When it comes to um, dealing with incontinence, uh, the thing that I would say uh, is that, you know, of course, you want to try to make sure that, you know, you empty as much as you can before you en engage in the sexual session. Um, that's important to do. Uh, if during the process um, there is incontinence, uh, it's important to um, it's important to share with your partner uh, a little bit about the fact that that may happen, uh, because in doing that, you know, one may experience a, a little bit of embarrassment, but at the same time, it's important again to kind of keep open communication when it comes to sexual engagement. Uh, what you can do is just empty as much as possible. And when you're engaging sexually with the person, if you're feeling any kind of a sensation coming on, you know, you can uh, withdraw and, you know, quickly go and try to take care of that. There are differences with couples that I have that are older. When I speak to them, we talk about various things that they can do, like they can um, take precautions in the bed to have down materials that would assist in not making the experience very uncomfortable, like with plastics and other things. So um, with the incontinence, it's gonna be according to like, it's an on an individual basis where it's happening at and how often it's happening. And the best that I can just say to a person is to empty yourself as much as you can before you engage. And if you find that you're having that more during the session, please also speak to your medical doctor and at the same time, when you come, when you uh, make efforts to um, engage, if that happens, be open and talk to your spouse uh, or your significant other and let them express anything that they may be experiencing uh, because it's sometimes very difficult with that because it can just happen. Okay, the next, the next, excuse me. Excuse me. So the next question that we received, um, some common antidepressants, SSRIs, can cause even worse ED. Um, can you maybe comment about that? I know you spoke a little bit about that earlier, uh, but I guess maybe finding that balance in between the depression that you mentioned, as well as the side effects of medicine. Um, so can you explain that a little bit further, please? I think you're muted again. Okay, so yes, I can. This is one of those things where it's just very critical to talk to the medical doctor, the MD that is prescribing medications because uh, this is very different. Uh, in taking the antidepressants, some antidepressant side effect, like you said, is going to be that impact on sexual functioning. There's some antidepressants that have less of a side effect than others. Um, there are medications like Wellbutrin that doesn't impact one's uh, sexual functioning as much. So the best thing to do when it comes to deciding about the antidepressants, because it's important to follow your, your doctor's instruction, your medical doctor, all of us working in psychotherapy, working in clinical sexology, all of these will direct you back to your doctor when it comes to the idea of any change in medication, anything about medication or what you need to take. However, in speaking to your doctor, if you are experiencing uh, this um, decrease um, and you're experiencing erectile dysfunction as a side effect, talk to them about it and then ask them about any other med that may work that wouldn't have such an impact. Some of them have less of an impact than others. And then there may be times in taking certain antidepressants that one may have a period of time that they experience uh, erectile dysfunction and then after they're taking it after a while, they may find that they regain 
uh, their ability to obtain and maintain erections. So it's so different for each person. It's so important to talk to your medical doc about that part. All right, All so right. the next question well, is a little bit of a loaded question. So what are some ways to develop new skills to overcome the physical and the physical, mental and emotional um, problems associated with Parkinson's or part two are some ways to reawaken that confidence and enjoyment um, that may have been impacted with the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease? You might have to unmute uh, you. Gonna, you. Okay. I'm going to ask you to do the first part again because I want to answer a little bit of that. And okay. then I want you to okay. do the second one because I think that's it's important to answer this. So if you can read that first question again, I want to give an answer and then we'll come back to the second. So it says developing new sexual skills to overcome physical, mental, and emotional problems associated with Parkinson's disease. The, the thing that you can do to develop new skills is be open. Be open to uh, trying different things, exploring different things. There are magazines and books that you can pick up that talk about positions and different things that may be fun. You know, even with, even without Parkinson's, just, just the, these are things too, and I wanna just say this, that, that everyday people experience as well. Just trying to add some, some, some more punch back into their sex life. Uh, so the thing you gotta do is just stay open. You can try toys, go to sex shops, uh, be willing to experience things with your partner, maybe that you haven't before. You know, uh, some of the things we talk about perhaps is sitting down, you know, what, what, what makes your partner excited? What makes you excited? Is there something that we can perhaps view or, it, or, or become engaged in that may make us both excited? Uh, and um, just even with age and other things, there may be a decrease in one sexual desire, libido and everything else. Parkinson's, the thing with this disease is that we definitely know that there, it's going to be diminished. But just in general, in life overall, these things can become diminished as well. So there are endless things that you can do. Just stay open, uh, invite your partner to give some ideas, uh, listen to friends and other people that may uh, try different things, and just know that even if you did not have this illness with age and with other things, these things just impact the general population as well. It's a part of getting older, growing up, wanting something new. Just stay open, stay creative to that part of it. And as a sexologist, I invite couples to do that. The next part of the question is strategies for reawakening confidence, enjoyment, and physical skills after not having sex since the onset of, this, of the diagnosis. Okay. One of the things that you can do is it'll be important to sit down and talk to your partner, talk to your partner, talk to your spouse and let them know, and, you know, as if they don't know, they already do know that, you know, we're not engaging sexually. And I want to change that. I, I, I want to go. I want to I want to re I want to reinvigorate that in our lives. I, I want to love you. I want to squeeze you. I want to be with you. And uh, um, and it, whether it's a woman or a man, tell your partner you're you're interested in reengaging in that part of your life. You know, talk about being a whole person. You know, not just physically and mentally. It's emotionally, sexually. It's your sexual health, your mental health, your physical health. All of that's important. You want to develop a healthy sexual life. You want to invite that back into your life. And you start by talking about it and talk about the fact that you wanna do it and you're open to doing it. Reach out for professional help, like I said, for, from people such as myself as sexologists. That's what we're here about. We're excited and always invigorated to talk to couples that want to enhance, improve, change, increase, make better their sex lives. And we're definitely very open to talking with you and your partner. Okay, perfect. Another question that we received are what are some ways to increase emotional intimacy due to the lack of physical that can happen with Parkinson's disease? Well, the, the things that can happen is to spend time, 
Spending time with your partner is a way to reconnect. Emotional intimacy can be done with simple things, um, cards, flowers, those typical things. Uh, the emotional part can also be just reconnected by acknowledging um, or, or saying something about how they look, saying something about how you feel about them, letting them know that I'm still attracted to you, letting them know I still am in, I'm still interested in you sexually. I want to be involved with you sexually. All of those things, you know, and the best thing to do is to be empowered by talking about it. Go to your partner and let them know you want to be involved. A lot of times when I talk to couples, one of the main problems that happen with sexual intimacy is they say, well, my partner doesn't talk about it. My partner doesn't seem to be interested. I would like romance. I would like, um, I would like more interest. And what happens is a lot of times we become so preoccupied with what's going on that we forget about our partner. And sometimes our partner may become so involved in helping us with dealing with the illness of anything that they stop realizing that we're people, we're human beings, we need touch. We need all of those things that they're very important. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. And our final and our question. Final question. Um, do you see people over Zoom in another state or do you accept Medicare? Repeat that one more time for me, Naomi. Do you see people, do you see people over, people Zoom, over Zoom in another state, in another state or, do you, accept or Medicare? do you accept Medicare? Absolutely both. I accept Medicare and I see people across the country over Zoom and in many different ways. Um, and the other thing too that I just want to share is that that's the thing that has made everything so beautiful. Like even as I'm sitting here and we're doing this webinar, this is so wonderful to be able to share information and knowledge with people and they can be in the living room, they can be anywhere and we can talk about things in the moment. Uh, so yes, telehealth is alive and well. And I'm very, very excited about it because I think it makes a big difference. All right, well, All right. we're well, going to, to have some have last minute announcements and then we are going to close, to out, close out for the day uh there is so if you, uh, have, you have so i'm not sure why we're getting feedback okay if you have any additional questions or would like to speak to someone from our chapter uh, i encourage you to visit our websites or email us or call us using the contact information on this slide next slide next please slide, please I would like to would remind like to everyone that April is Parkinson's Awareness Month and that April 11th is World Parkinson's Awareness Day. At APDA Virginia and at all chapters around the country, we are planning a few things to raise awareness and understanding Parkinson's disease, particularly to the general population. So stay tuned for more details on that. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar next month on April 18th. We will have Nancy Lowe from the Grand Virginia Grand Drivers Program to discuss Parkinson's disease and knowing about when it is time to give up the car keys. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And it is indeed my pleasure to tell you that registration is now open for our 2023 Optimism Walk which would take place on June 3rd at the War Hall Sports Complex in Williamsburg, Virginia. Please visit our website to register for that. Next slide, please. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Sheaf Shafe, for joining us today and sharing this valuable information. And many thanks, and to, many thanks everyone to everyone participating, everyone in, today's participating in today's discussion. discussion. Naomi, they were the only thing I were, I'm sorry. Name of the only Naomi, the only thing I wanted to share was I, I will leave you information for anyone to contact me. I did see that. So you will have all that information. Okay, perfect. So we so will be we will be sending out uh, a worksheet or just a, a summary of, of what Dr. Shafe talked about today. Um so we want to thank her for joining us today and many thanks to everyone participating in today's discussion.
if you missed the program or joined late, uh, no need to worry that there will be a recording um, sent out as well as a, a summary of what Dr. Shave talked about today. Uh, finally, uh, we will be sending out an evaluation. So please feel free to include your comments and feedback um, on the evaluation form. You can check our website to request our weekly newsletter to stay informed of all that's going on at APDA. So again, thank you for your participation and have a great rest of your day.